In the late 1950s, the world teetered on the brink of nuclear annihilation. The Soviet Union had unleashed a new breed of strategic bombers, capable of Mach 2 speeds and soaring at altitudes as high as 80,000 feet. The stakes were unimaginably high, and the United Kingdom needed a rapid response guardian, and it needed one fast. It had no aircraft that could reach similar heights and speeds. Faced with this imminent threat, the UK turned to the Saunders Row SR-53, no ordinary interceptor. It was a dual-engine marvel, equipped with both a rocket engine for rapid climbs and a jet engine for sustained flight. Within just 2 minutes 30 seconds, the SR-53 could ascend 60,000 feet, positioning itself to intercept incoming threats with its infrared-guided missiles. It was engineered to be the UK's first line of defense against high-altitude, high-speed bombers. But the SR-53 was not just about speed and altitude. It represented a leap in engineering thought. Its dual-engine system allowed for rapid ascent to intercept threats and the fuel efficiency to return safely, offering a practical solution to a complex problem. As test flights commenced, the SR-53 showed promise, but it also faced an uncertain future. Advances in missile technology were beginning to overshadow traditional interceptors. And then, during one fateful test flight, something went terribly wrong. During World War II, the significance of strategic bombing in shaping modern warfare became evident. And now, after the capitulation of Italy, Nazi Germany, and the Nippon Empire, a new enemy had emerged in the East. The primary threat, apart from its nuclear ambitions, was posed by advanced strategic bombers with the capability to evade ground defenses and deliver devastating payloads unrestrained, leading to a concerted effort to equip frontline countries like Britain and France with adept high-speed interceptors to effectively counter this danger. As the Cold War began, nations recognized the need to enhance air defenses. For one, Nazi Germany had showcased advancements in rocket-powered aircraft like the Messerschmitt Me-163 and Bachem BA-349, which offered unmatched climb rates for intercepting enemy bombers. Post-war, Allied nations, especially Britain, extensively studied German rocket technology. The crucial factor for an interceptor at the time, exemplified by the German Messerschmitt Me-163, or Comet, was rapid rate of climb to altitude and speed to target, highlighting rocket technology's superiority in quickly countering incoming aerial threats compared to early turbojet technology. In turn, Britain focused on creating liquid propellant rockets for rocket-assisted takeoff gear to aid aircraft during takeoff and climb phases. Two rockets were developed by Britain, the de Havilland Sprite and the Armstrong Siddeley Snarler, which used a propellant called High Test Peroxide, or HTP, and a mix of methanol, water, and liquid oxygen, respectively. And tests were underway. In May 1951, concerns over the growing Soviet strategic bomber capabilities prompted the British Air Ministry to devise Operational Requirement OR301, aimed at developing a rocket-powered interceptor capable of rapidly ascending to 60,000 feet within two and a half minutes. Pressingly, the anticipation of swift advancements in Soviet aircraft technology justified these stringent demands. By the early 1960s, worries arose that Soviet bombers might exceed the sound barrier and reach speeds of Mach 2, flying at altitudes up to 80,000 feet. Consequently, an effective defense interceptor was needed to match these speeds and exhibit exceptional climb rates for timely interception of high-flying bombers. Progress made with the Sprite and the Snarler paved the way for a more advanced rocket engine tailored to a practical point defense interceptor. OR-301 called for remarkable features such as ramp launches and skid landings. Collaborative discussions with aviation companies led to an updated version, specification F-124T, allowing mixed power plants and a conventional undercarriage. Shared with multiple British aircraft manufacturers on February 21, 1951, this revised specification invited submissions aligned with the new criteria. Specification F-124T was a directive that called for the development of a rocket-powered interceptor aircraft. The main criteria of the specification were a minimum rate of climb of 24,000 feet per minute and the ability to carry the de Havilland Fire Streak IR-guided missile. Prominent companies like Blackburn, Bristol, Ferry, and Westland soon showed interest. Yet, a significant challenge faced by the design teams was the propulsion system for the aircraft. Rocket motors, or boosters, had limited fuel capacity, resulting in only a few minutes of operational performance. This posed a problem, as the same propulsion system was expected to power the aircraft during its engagement with enemy targets, as well as during its travel to and from the engagement area. 
due to the impracticality of relying solely on rocket power, a new requirement emerged, the inclusion of a turbojet engine to manage the phases before and after the attack run. After all, even the renowned ME-163 could only fly for about seven minutes. Curiously, at first, Saunders Row found itself excluded from the list of companies entrusted with the project specifications. This omission stemmed from the Supply Ministry's perception that the company's main focus was on crafting flying boats, a line of work deemed irrelevant to the project at hand. Yet this perception was far from accurate, as Saunders Row harbored a genuine interest in this new venture. Unbeknownst to many, they had independently undertaken extensive studies in both high-altitude and high-speed flight. Heading these initiatives was Morris Brennan, the chief designer at Saunders Row, who had led his team in exploring advanced concepts for rocket-propelled aircraft. Their objective was to develop aircraft capable of reaching extraordinary altitudes of up to 100,000 feet. Notably, they produced an extensive report named Investigation of Problems of Pure Rocket Fighter Aircraft. This report coincided with the Ministry's official release of project specifications. Recognizing the absence of project details and an official invitation, Saunders Row proactively reached out to the Ministry to address this oversight. Consequently, on March 24, 1951, the Ministry rectified the situation by inviting the company to participate, alongside other competitors, in submitting their design proposals. In response to revised requirements and a significant increase in project commitment, Avro and Saunders Row were the only two companies that opted to pursue specification F-124T. This led to the development of the Model 720 by Avro and the P-154 by Saunders Row. The latter never made it past the drawing board. As April of 1951 drew to a close, Saunders Row unveiled their comprehensive proposal. At its core lay the SR-53 design, a vividly imagined aircraft that promised high-speed prowess. The SR-53 boasted an impressive design featuring sleek lines and smooth curves. The SR-53 sported a pointed nose and a distinctive T-style tail unit framed in a delta wing structure, exuding a streamlined appearance. Initially, there were plans to develop a custom rocket motor for the SR-53 due to the unsatisfactory options available. However, the immense challenges involved led to a change in approach. The aircraft's rear held a vertical fin with high-set horizontal planes. Twin exhaust ports beneath the tail housed the unique combination power plant, where an upper Armstrong Siddeley Viper turbojet and a lower de Havilland Spectre rocket booster provided thrust. It was built to propel the craft to a breathtaking Mach 2.44, or 1,611 miles per hour, at the remarkable altitude of 60,000 feet. Even more striking was the projected climb rate, a staggering 52,000 feet per minute, hovering around the altitude of 50,000 feet. For takeoffs, a detachable undercarriage, coupled with cordite-based booster rockets, could be enlisted to ensure a smooth and quick ascent. Initially, a safety feature was sketched into the design, an entire cabin that could be jettisoned in case of emergencies, facilitating the pilot's escape. However, the intricacies of this arrangement eventually gave way to a more conventional ejection seat, as its development proved to be too big a challenge. The absence of an interceptor radar in the nose allowed for a smaller nose cone. The pilot occupied a two-piece canopy backed by a raised fuselage spine to accommodate the propulsion systems and fuel. With the delta-shaped wing and mid-mounted main planes, the SR-53 featured clipped wingtips for missile armament and overall dimensions spanning 45 feet in length a wingspan of 25 feet and a height of 10.9 feet. Nevertheless, a significant drawback was its limited endurance due to the Spectre rocket. On October 30th, 1952, the Ministry granted Saunders Row the green light to construct three prototypes, designated XD-145, XD-151, and XD-153. Soon, however, Saunders Row experienced challenges with their initial glide home approach for aircraft return acknowledging its risks and financial burden. They then conceived a novel idea, integrating a secondary jet engine for the return journey. The Ministry of Aviation expressed strong interest in this concept, urging all interested companies and setting off a series of research projects. By October 1952, the aircraft's design had been solidified. This revised version included critical enhancements such as new flap configurations, adjusted engine placements, and repositioned tailplanes. Towards the end of the year, refinements to the project led to the release of an improved project specification, with a focus on enhancing armament capabilities, ultimately leading to the adoption of the Blue Jay infrared-guided air-to-air missile. 
The transformation from the flawed guide-home approach to the innovative integration of a secondary jet engine marked a significant turning point. The finalized design, with its distinct features, represented a collaborative effort prompted by the Ministry's enthusiasm, ultimately leading to a more promising aircraft concept. Furthermore, by 1955, Avro discontinued the development of their Model 720 due to the high concurrent development costs of both aircraft. Their shift in focus resulted in the SR-53 becoming the prominent choice for further advancement. In a relatively short period, the SR-53 program faced various challenges. Evolving technologies and changing battlefield requirements clashed with the slow development of the design, which was further hindered by its inherent complexity. Regardless, the first SR-53 prototype, known as XD-145, was sent to RAF Boscombe Down in June 1956. Engine trials occurred in January and April 1957. On May 9, 1957, the aircraft attempted its first ground taxi, followed by its momentous inaugural test flight on May 16. The second prototype, XD-151, had its first flight on December 6, 1957. The testing process, spanning 56 sorties, showcased the aircraft's ease of flight and commendable control, reaching speeds up to Mach 1.33. But tragedy struck during testing on June 5, 1958, when XD-151 encountered an accident during takeoff. The aircraft veered off the runway, collided with a light post, and resulted in a catastrophic explosion. Beyond the regrettable incident, the first instance of the SR-53 taking to the skies occurred a little over a month subsequent to the release of an influential announcement. The 1957 Defense White Paper outlined a strategic shift for the UK towards prioritizing missiles over manned aircraft. Additionally, the technological landscape had evolved significantly since the inception of the SR-53, witnessing marked advancements in jet propulsion and radar capabilities, enabling the earlier detection of enemy bombers. In light of these transformations, the relevance of an aircraft like the SR-53 dwindled. Consequently, the project came to an end on July 29, 1960, leaving the third prototype, XD-153, unconstructed. Originally envisioned as a production-quality interceptor for the Royal Air Force, the SR-53 underwent a shift in its purpose and design. It transitioned from its intended role to become an experimental platform focused on collecting data. Meanwhile, the P-177, which shared some similarities with the SR-53, took the lead as a potential operational interceptor. This newer design boasted larger dimensions, increased power, and radar capabilities, positioning it as a fearsome interceptor if it had been developed further. Following the discontinuation of the P-177, the experimental SR-53 lost its significance. However, due to its exceptional performance, particularly in reaching high altitudes, the aircraft continued to serve in flight testing. Despite its risks, pilots developed an attachment to the XD-145 variant of the SR-53, praising its responsive controls and stability during flights. Eventually, the XD-145 was spared from destruction and was preserved as an exhibit at the Royal Air Force Museum Cosford, situated near Wolverhampton, becoming a symbol of its era.